Hello, everybody. Um, I want to welcome you uh, on our event, Sustainable Gen AI. Um, the event uh, will be, yeah, like the title says, ah, first me, uh, that's me, I'm Frederik, data engineer of Data Minded, um, also leading the strategy chapter within Data Minded. And I will try to guide you through this evening. Um, there will be three talks this evening. The first one will be about fundamental concepts of Gen AI, um, uh, how to get data into the model and some trade-offs that you need to make if you want to build a Gen AI use case. In the second talk, I will give a presentation which will focus more on a specific use case and then figure out how we can improve this use case by leveraging metadata and also on how to integrate a use case in an existing data platform. Then there will be a break, and in the end, uh, Johnny will give a presentation about sustainably scaling Gen AI initiatives. So um, here again, the agenda, two talks, Hannes will give a presentation, then I will give a presentation, there will be a short break. Then you can uh, again go downstairs, take a drink, uh, take something to eat if there is a leftover. Uh, after the break, Johnny will give a presentation, and then in the end, there is still time to connect with each other. So that's all that I wanted to say. Um, I hope you have a fun evening and learn a lot. So then uh, it's time for Hans. <clears throat> all right, good evening everybody. So um, my name is Hans de Smit, like my, uh, the slide says. I'm a data engineer at Data Mined um, in September almost three years now, so time flies by. And before that, I was a student at the KL, close by. I was a master of computer science student, um, focused on AI. And uh, in my studies, I was already busy with deep learning and neural networks, etc. But like currently, the AI field is going like a train. It's a hype train that goes fast. It's going fast as like a, like a rocket. And if you're a bit like me, it is maybe hard to understand and maybe sometimes grasp the, the concepts and how they relate. So I try to find out and today I'm trying to share with you um, to shine a light on the black box called Gen AI. So let's start with an example I think everybody knows here. Uh, if not, I think you're living in a pineapple at the bottom of the sea. Um, but um, that being said, I will try to to cross the ID and I will try to, instead of peel the onion, I will try to build the onion. So let's look at JetGPT like it's an onion and let's start at the center. So at the center, there is Gen AI itself. What is Gen AI? Gen AI is artificial intelligence. That is a form um, that generates data. Simple as that. Um, there are six modalities that um, Gen AI can create, which can be code, it can generate images, it can generate video, text, 3D objects, and speech. And it does so all starting from a prompt. A prompt can be text, a prompt can be images. Um, for example, you can ask GPT, just pass it an image, and it will describe you the image without you even asking to describe the image. Um, so, it can uh, start from a prompt from whatever modality. All right, let's peel up the onion. Let's get another layer, transformers. And I'm not talking about the Michael Bay kind with a lot of explosions, unfortunately, or luckily. Um, it started all with a paper um, in 2017 called Attention is All You Need, which is based on a song by the Beatles. If you don't know, love is all you need. Um, and um, a transformer is a neural network architecture um, that is served as a building block for Gen AI. A lot of almost all Gen AI that we see today is based on that neural ne network architecture. And it looks complex and I won't dive into detail how it exactly works. There are videos on YouTube that do much better than I would do. However, I will want to establish some context. An important context is tokens. So you have a tokenizer and it takes a text. If you input prompt text as a prompt, it takes it 
and it splits it up. Here is an example. You can do it in ChatGPT as well. And I give some text and it creates tokens out of it. And a token is basically uh, a representation. And it's about four characters represents a token, give or take in the English language. So um, the tokens are being created and afterwards we make embeddings from them. And embeddings um, or embedding is a process of converting the words to numerical vectors. And these vectors, the Gen AI or the model, uh, can much better understand and work with them. So then a lot of magic happens and we get some outputs. I won't go into detail about the magic. Um, however, for example, the output could be then the chance on what the next word or the next token would be. All right. So let's layer it up some more. We have Gen AI, a layer on top of it, performers. Let's go one further, foundation models. All right, what is a foundation model? A foundation model is an AI model with transformer architecture that is trained on vast amounts of unlabeled data. And by doing so, you enable to adapt them to a, a varied amount of tasks. And even now, the late, the last few years, these foundation models are becoming multi-model. So I said earlier, there are multi-six modalities, text, images, etc. Now they're becoming multimodal, so understanding and getting as input multiple modalities. For example, you can have uh, Gemini, which understands both images and text, as GPT now does as well. So you create them and you, you train them on vast amounts of data. And in data mined, um, we, or in the time when I was hired, they told me we hire based on T profiles. So we want people to have a big base, but also have some expertise. And with foundation models, you give them a big base. They understand a lot, but they don't have any expertise yet. The T part is missing. So we can train them further, fine tune them further with expertise. And that is what a large language model is in, in essence. In essence, a large language model is a foundation model that's been designed to understand and generate human language. They are fine-tuned for specific tasks, and it can be broad human language, but it can also be more specific towards summarization, sentiment analysis, etc. So you adapt them to a specific profile, a T profile. All right, we have our model. Um, we have a Gen AI application, right? We've done it, we made it. Um, we have a famous saying at Data Mined: um, "You know nothing until you deploy it to production." What I mean by this is there is a lot more going around the model. You need to bring it into production, you need to maintain it, you need to monitor it, you need to log it, etc., etc. Um, and that's basically the union I want to build. So ChatGPT, in essence, is Gen AI. It generates data. It is based on transformer architecture. It is a foundation model. That's why also GPT came from, generative pre-trained transformer, by the way. Then you have the LLM part, the chat in the chat GPT part, really used to chat, um, and it's built into an application. You can call the API, it's a full-blown application, you go to the website and start talking to the model. All right, sounds nice. So how do you get to the promised land? What options do you have when building Gen AI? So um, I wanna show you two important axes of building Gen AI applications. The first being, how do you pass data to the model? How do you pass the information? And secondly, what model to pick? Let's start with first, how to pass information to the model, or also called prompt engineering. The most basic example is called zero-shot prompting. And it means that you use the prompt, you send to the application to the model, won't contain any examples or any demonstration. You just say it how it is. You can see an example here, for example. Here I ask the model, uh, classify the text into neutral, negative, positive, uh, and give it the sentiment. And it says, I think the vacation is okay. It is indeed neutral. I don't give any examples. I just give the prompt. And it's nice because it doesn't require much of anything and it's very flexible. This way of prompting, sending information, you can send whatever you want, you can do whatever you want. Um, 
and you don't need external data or examples or whatever. However, it is also limited in performance. You might have experienced the same when asking software as GPT and it doesn't really understand or you have to narrow it down a bit, etc. So next step is to give it some examples. And that's called few shot prompting. So in this case, uh, you give it more context, you enable in-context learning, which means uh, you get the model has a temporary um, memory, so to say. It can temporarily learn from the, from the information you give, the context. And here's an example. So here I say, this is awesome, which is positive. This is bad, negative example, etc. And here the model also says negative. And um, you can even say you don't even have to, to, to put positive at the end. You can be very flexible in this, and the model will really understand the relation between them. So there's a lot of ways to fine tune this, even the few shot prompting. It is also very flexible. You can create your own examples. You often have the examples or demonstrations. Um, the performance is better than if you would give no examples if it's needed. However, you do need to construct the examples. It takes some time to construct them and give them to the model. And I've shown here a few examples, but you can't give a lot of context. You can't give a lot of information. Or, yeah, can you? So imagine the model has never read the greatest trilogy ever been written, the Lord of the Rings. And what if I want to know how is the act of Gimli called? I would need to pass three books. All the Lord of the Rings books I would to pass as context. So I have my, uh, my three books. And you might be thinking, well, these get yeah, tokenized. So they'll be, the three books will be in tokens. That's in total 600,000 tokens for the whole of the Lord of the Rings. And to give a reference, um, Gemini, the ChatGPT4, if you have the pro version, you can pass 120K tokens. So you would need four times that. But you have also very large context models, such as the Gemini, which has 1 million tokens as a context. So basically, you can give the whole of the Lord of the Rings as context to the model and ask the question is, what is the name of Gimli's X? And you pause that big context, and you would receive a very good answer. Because of the large context, it can reason very, very well, also because of the big context. Um, and you get very accurate results. However, it can be slow since you have to pass yeah, three books in information. As well as the first thing you might think of, it can become very costly. Um, when talking, for, for example, for Gemini, it's token based you pay. So I did the calculations, or better said, GPT did the calculations for me. Um, and it would cost around eight euros for a single question, which is fine if you want want, want only have one question about Kimmy. However, if you have more, it doesn't scale. So another option that you can use is the RAG system or retrieval augmented generation, which um, is coming up quite big. So how does it work? You take your books and you make embeddings out of them and you store them in a database. Most of the time, a specific database called a vector database specifically uh, for storing them. And you do that with an embedding model, a model specifically designed to do those embeddings. So when you ask your question, you also embed the same question. The prompt, you also embed, and that's what you will use to do a similarity check. What part of my three books is closest in a mathematical sense to my questions? And that it will give us an answer, and you can return that together with the prompt to the model and get the result. And you can already see it is much more complex. So there is a lot more components in there. You have a vector database, you have an embedding model. And in the, that being said, your time to market will be much slower because you need to develop foundations. Um, the performance is good. You pass exactly the information you need. So you only pass the pages in Lord of the Rings where Gimli is being mentioned, for example. And because you pass less information, your runtime costs will be lower. Not saying the operational cost, because you need some platform foundation. However, the runtime costs will at least be a lot lower. All right. So 
I've been talking about all these different ways of prompt engineering. So it starts from a very simple example with zero shot prompting until RAX. And the performance has increased, at least for specific use cases, but also the data you need has gone up as well as the complexity. And next to that, there is a lot more ways of to do prompt engineering, like chain of thought prompts and three of thought prompts, where there is something in the middle. However, I will not go into detail because it's quite specific. All right. We've seen how to pass information to the model. Now, what model do I have to pick? I will show you three trade-offs. Um, open source versus closed source models, off the shelf versus fine tuning, and managed hosting versus self-hosting. So you can use these three trade-offs to decide, or at least help you guide you what model to select. All right, let's start with the first trade-off. Closed source versus open source. Closed source are, of course, models that are developed by companies. Some examples are Gemini or Midjourney to create, generate images. Cloud models um, are also uh, closed source. And these companies, um, yes, often have deep pockets with deep research, large research departments. So their models are often very good. Next to that, you also have open source models, either developed by companies as well, like Meta, Develop Lama 2, or Stable Diffusion, which are either community driven or as well by companies. So like I mentioned, the state of the art accuracy is often more to the closed source <coughs> because they have deep pockets, they have the research departments where money is, is often the case, the better performance. However, you can't see inside of the models of closed source models. You can't see what's going on, open source you can. So you have more transparency and flexibility. And lastly, often when you pay more or in the closed source uh, world, you have better support, more new versions, better updates, etc. While in open source, you might lag a little bit behind. All right, our second trade-off. Let's look at fine tuning versus off the shelf. So what do I mean by fine tuning? We've seen, okay, you can pass information to the model, but it doesn't change the model itself. With fine tuning, we actually change the model itself and look at the weights and the parameters inside and try to adapt it so that it better fits our use case and you have a better chance of that it does what you want it to do. So the potential for better results for a specific use case is also higher. And off the shelf, when you take a model that they provide, uh, it might not fulfill your specific specificity of the use case. Next to that, um, fine-tuning requires extra MLOps. You need a model registry. You need to train in pipelines, etc. It requires better foundations. In comparison to an off-the-shelf model, okay, you also need MLOps. What about the validation and logging and monitoring? But it's less complex. It's less, less verbose. And next to that, you also have clean data. When fine-tuning, you need to fine-tune it on some data. You need clean data. And like a lot of you might know, getting clean data is often a hard part. While off-the-shelf models, you don't need data to train because it's just off-the-shelf. All right, let's go to our last uh, trade-off, which is managed hosting versus self-hosting. And some examples of managed hosting are, for example, the Open, the open API, Open AI API. Um, Hugging Face is also where you can host models. Um, in contrast, you can host them themselves on any cloud provider or in your basement, like Robert loves to do. Um, and when using managed hosting, you need less or little platform foundations. While self-hosting, you would do need to compute the storage uh, and you need to be able to scale it. That being said, it is faster time to market to have it managed because you don't need that foundations. And lastly, it could be when you use managed hosting and for example, you use an API and your data is not very close to where the compute is, you might get a higher risk of latency. While you host it yourself, it is often closer to the data itself and you have less risk of latency issues if that is a problem for your use case. All right, so I've talked about how to pass information to the model and I've talked about some trade-offs that can help you with model selection. 
You can bring it together. And this is an overwhelming slide, so I don't expect you to understand, yeah, to really um, grasp it all, or that quickly at least. Um, so I have the prompt engineering here, which you have a lot of options, and you have a lot of options on the model selection. So you can make a matrix out of it, and you can combine them. And as you can see, green is better, that is worse. There are some pitfalls, so to say, or there are trade-offs you have to make. And there are a lot of things to keep in mind. You have to keep in mind how flexible does it need to be, the cost, the knowledge requirements of your team, the platform requirements you have, the ability to, go to, to governance as well as privacy, what is the performance or the accuracy, how fast can you get it to market, and how much data do you need. These are all aspects you need to take in mind. And if you're interested in more, come talk to me after the, the presentations and you can check it out. Um, so I presented these two axes how to pass model to the information and the model. So that's it. We're done. We pick in the matrix and ready. Unfortunately, like our good friends of MC Kenzie, I uh, like to say the major challenge lies in making the data available. It's not about the model itself. It's about uh, what's around it. So we often see when companies uh, want some ML in place and AI, they have a perception of, okay, it's the model code and we're ready, we can go to production. And often there's a lot more around it. You need, like I said, the ingestion of the data, the versioning, what about the lineage, what about the monitor logging, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot more. And that brings to my first conclusion, Gen AI, a Gen AI model is not a Gen AI application. There is a lot more, you need foundations, and it's not different from Gen AI than it is to AI. For both, you need foundation for Gen AI even more so, I would say. But my, uh, my colleague Johnny will, uh, will go further on that. Secondly, I give you two important, two major, not the only one, two major axes when developing Gen AI application. How to pass information to the model and how to select the model. And lastly, uh, I give you three key considerations in choosing model. Do you go open source versus closed source? Do you go off the shelf model or do you fine tune it yourself? Do you host it yourself? Or do you take a managed solution? So with that being said, um, yeah, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions. <laughs> yes. Consideration with the managed APIs versus risk or data leakage, or how much you trust the database manager for hosting the model? How is that? What's the trust level or like that you should have from open AI or running based on that sense? Yeah. Um, in the managed sense itself, you would also have, you can think of, okay, you can use an API, like I mentioned, and there's also the part of managed solution like AWS Bedrock, etc. So even there you have a bit more of a split off. I would say in the API, yeah, first of all, the data goes off the internet, which is safe, but you give all your private information to, um, yeah, to the third company. And I think for a lot of private data, it can be um, for compliance issues, maybe not that reasonable. Um, in that sense, I'm not an expert in the GDPR branch of things and how well the contracts hold up. Um, but I think it's a very reasonable question to ask also when designing your yeah, data product. So I can't answer it for you, but I think it's an important question. Any other? You can go first and you can go second. Also get the same expert uh, uh, level of 
Um, I think that it's very important to first ask the question yourself when um, if if it's a, a break point. You want to say something, Michael? No, there's a guest. I think. Oh, okay. Um, no, I think it really depends on your strategy. If the, if it's really a break point, if you can't use the open API in production because of data, etc. Um, I think either if it's never possible. I would say, yeah, maybe don't go that route in the first place and really test immediately and give that up in the strategy because if you explain or if you explain your strategy, you understand you first test with open source model because production, you will never be able to reach it. Or you do the other way around and you say, okay, in your strategy plan, you say uh, very clearly with a big disclaimer, we test the POC first if the data is viable, et cetera. And afterwards we test a phase two, you have two POCs the first one being, is my data good enough to do the use case? My second being, are the closed source model? And I think if you yeah, make your strategy, your AI strategy that good or that clear, especially to the business, I think you can sell it. But I think it really comes down to how you sell your strategy. That's a very good question. And to be fully honest, I'm not that sure about model validation. I didn't read into it that much. So I can't really answer your question, honestly. But there, there are a lot of references I can give you about that really go into how do you do Gen AI model validation and how do you know it's, it's OK? And Johnny, my colleague, will talk about it a bit later as well, that there are a lot of issues with how to solve it technically. I, I can't really give you, you an answer on this. Right. Any other? Thank you for listening. Good evening. I'm, uh, I'm Michael, a colleague of uh, Hannes and Frederick. I'm uh, within Data Mindnet uh, leading our people department, if you want, and also consulting. And I'm just sneaking in very quickly to hear from you, actually. And I have a small uh, uh, two questions, actually. Um, so you can, uh, easiest is to scan the barcode with your phone. And then I would love to um, get some feedback from you. Can you raise your hand when you're in? Okay. Few few people left. Okay. First question. I'm curious, like, where are you and your company in, in the journey? Is, are you rather at the beginning? Are you experimenting or are you already a bit further indeed and have some cases deployed to production? Wow, that's actually honestly exceeding what I was expecting. Um, 
a lot of companies experimenting. Six of you already having cases deployed to production. R really nice. Uh, anybody wants to share his or her experience so far with the group? No? Fine. You, you want to, you want to, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Great. It's really easy to start something like a chatbot process and it's very broad. We can use uh, some patch language models to generate some text and interact with uh, camera users. And I have this experience in building uh, uh, for my clients uh, chatbots in Twitter and uh, X and uh, Telegram. But uh, when I try to give something more complex, what involves several agents? Uh, and it's more close to production and communication between these countries. Uh, we have to use some uh, <coughs> frameworks because it's, uh, if you use just hard code prompts uh, to uh, uh, put, uh, it will be disaster. And small changes in API from providers or choosing another providers uh, bring to uh, just uh, just collapse in uh, final production. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so for me, so my uh, question is uh, choosing the uh, right uh, framework. Uh, uh, it's very easy start from something uh, like a uh, round chain, but it's not uh, good for something uh, really complex. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. And uh, now on this vision, uh, well, let's go with uh, Ramaitis and uh, let's uh, start a combination of CRISPR uh, and Ramaitis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think as, as, as Hannes explained, it's probably easy to get started somehow. Um, but moving to production is, is something else. So the, the next speech will also be a very specific example, starting from yon, one use case. What does it take? And then our third topic will be about, okay, if you think about end use cases, you want to scale this and make this sustainable. That is the two steps that we have later tonight and hope to help you in, in getting some more insights. Okay. Then I have a second question for you. Uh, yeah, so if, if you can rank, because I'm interested in the relative importance, if you can rank like a, the challenges involved as, as you as you see or experience them. As a, as a data company, I'm obviously happy to see that uh, data is on top. Yeah, okay. Well, what, what I take away also from this overview is that, that um, 
there's little outliers. It's, it's in a way quite balanced. So it, to me, confirms that this challenge of Gen AI or this opportunity of Gen AI is, uh, is rather multidimensional. And, and all of those typics, and there's obviously more. This is non-exhaustive, um, do matter. Okay. Thank you. Bart? Just one question, because your previous only focused on what really go into production. We have technical state that the job is done. The, the real job is done. It really does what it is what it promised to do. I see that six people here matched the right data. We have things in production. I'm not very curious. Does it bring the promises that we made? Because we have okay, it's still high today, and I'm very curious if it really, really will do what the promises have in the end, as the cost is quite significant for these kind for these kind of models. Is the ROI there uh, for these first use cases that we put into production? I don't know if somebody has experience. I don't, uh, but uh, I'm very curious with your experience in that balance. Yeah, of course, my company is fully based on Gen AI, so that's a solution we built. So, uh, of course, it works. Um, but what we see as a challenge to keep it working is that there's no like standard toolings to monitor, for example, and to keep and then to evaluate. So, while well, most technologies you have like frameworks that almost everyone uses and are very popular, and here everything is changing. So, we use lots of tools, but then we realize six months later that other tools, tools are suddenly better uh, and many of our challenges that we think many organizations will have similar challenges still there's no good tools for it because it's just also new um, but we do see there's a business case because you're saying it's expensive but it depends how you use it like for us for example we well it's some kind of chatbot you can say um, we have conversations with, uh, with customers and in the end it costs around Let's say five to ten cents for a conversation, but it's basically replacing an actual person talking to that person. So then there's a very, I mean, it is maybe ten times as uh, expensive to do that. So then the because business it's in your life, and you explained me during the meeting before, okay, what, what you're trying to do, and you're trying to sell kind of uh, travels to, to, to travel uh, trips to clients, but do they again buy from a Gen AI tool? Because okay, a human being is more costly, but again, potentially the, the client to buy. Well, if, the, if you have something which is cheap and nobody buys, the solution propose. Yeah, of course. Well, what we do is we need a software for cloud operators, so it's part of the customer journey that is being automated, but that is actually bringing additional service because it's basically an alternative for writing an email and getting an answer the next working day or calling, but you have to call during working hours. So it's really bringing additional value that it's almost impossible to do without the technology. Like you can have a call center that's working 24 seven, but even then making sure there's no waiting time is going to be possible. So there's really, I think one aspect is the cost that we can really, this is just one small typical actually use case, uh, but it's there's really no possibilities to offer additional services that, um, yeah, that you cannot do with art. And, and yes, for our clients, it is, it is uh... Yeah, I, I, I like the question, Bart. And, and um, I, I actually personally believe that it, the very important word here is, is use case. And identifying, first of all, what is the use case you're going to address or solve with Gen AI. And in that sense, it's not different than maybe traditional machine learning, right? Where you also need to think about benefits versus costs and value. Um, and another word, which is also here, is, is experimenting. I think the value in experimenting before you make the investment in all the technical foundations and, and, and components is, is probably to validate that your use case is generating the benefit that you imagine on paper. Um, uh, feasibility, identifying complexities and challenges. So I think there's yeah, a, an important role to play from a strategic perspective, identifying use cases, and then from a methodology perspective, start with experimenting, shortest path to proving that, 
and to then move to production um, with the right use cases. Okay, um, I'm moving forward to you, Frederick.